To make this very large flag case, I needed to build a 45 degree box joint jig. I started with some scrap 3 quarter inch thick birch plywood. The width doesn't really matter for this jig so long as it's wide enough to cover both miter slots. I then glued another piece of scrap that I had directly in the middle of the first piece that I cut. These pieces were then brad nailed together. I took care to make sure I didn't put any nails in what would eventually be the path of the blade. Trimming this proved to be an entirely unnecessary step as later I ended up trimming it even further. I then cut up some more scrap to make the bed supports. Next I trimmed a 45 degree miter onto each of these pieces. After setting the blade angle to 45 degrees, I cut a bevel on what will become the leading edge of the jig. The overall size of these pieces doesn't really matter, so long as they're high enough to make bed that will support your workpiece adequately. Make sure wherever you put a nail, it's well clear of where the blade will eventually run through. It's fairly important that you get these angles to line up perfectly. In retrospect, putting four of these supports on was overkill. The two on the outside would have been enough. For the face of the jig, I beveled another piece of scrap at 45. After getting all the supports attached, I then attached the face of the jig. The face is just a half inch thick piece of plywood cut to the same width as the jig with a 45 degree bevel on one end. The bevel is on the bottom and will ride parallel to the table saw surface. Again, be sure not to put a nail where the blade will eventually cut through. This next part is very important. I cut a one inch wide piece of three quarter inch plywood. It is exactly one inch wide. The only reason I'm counterboring these screw holes is because I didn't have long enough screws to get through a one inch wide piece and still grab onto the jig. Regardless, you would want to make sure to countersink the screw heads. Also, because it's plywood, you want to make sure to pre-drill the hole so you don't split the piece. With the screws just protruding, I put it on what's going to be the fence side of the jig and give it a light tap. This lets me know exactly where to drill my holes. This indexing bar needs to be exactly double of whatever width box joint you're trying to do. Because I'm doing half inch, this is one inch wide. For example, if you wanted to do quarter inch wide box joints, you would make this piece a half inch wide. And then we go through the fun of installing the dado stack. Because I'm doing half inch wide box joints, I set my dado stack to one half inch wide. Then I set the blade height to a half an inch. This first cut is to set the indexing pin. I've locked the fence in place and I'm not going to move it again until after I've fully attached the miter slot rails. At this point the jig's a lot longer than it's going to end up. I kept it this long to mitigate any kickback risks as I cut these dados. Now that I've cut that dado, I can remove the 1 inch wide spacer. Off camera, I milled some scrap hardwood to be exactly as wide as my miter slots and just slightly shallower. I then put four layers of masking tape on the bottom of these runners. The thickness of this tape will be just enough to make these runners stand proud of the surface of the table saw. Runners are thinner, you may need more layers of tape. And then I trim the excess. With the fence still exactly where it was when I cut the indexing dado, I get ready to glue the runners on. Make sure that the miter slots are clean and put the runners in tape side down. 
You don't want to get any glue on your cast iron surface because it will cause rust, so be sparing with the glue. Then set your jig on the runners, clamp it to the fence, and weight it down. At this point, the jig really doesn't need to be this long. So using the miter gauge, I trimmed the excess off. If you choose to do this, make sure you don't cut into where any nails are. I also trimmed the fronts of the miter slot runners. Off camera, I milled a piece of scrap hardwood to be exactly one half inch wide and one half inch thick. This is then glued into the dado slot that we cut earlier. It doesn't need to be this long, but make sure it protrudes from the leading edge of the jig. I then drew evenly spaced vertical lines on the face of the jig. These will serve as a visual reference to help me keep the board perfectly vertical when I'm cutting the fingers. Then cut a piece of fairly rough sandpaper to glue to the face of the jig. Spray adhesive works good for this. The reason I glue the piece of sandpaper to the face of the jig is to make a rough surface. This helps prevent the workpiece from sliding around when I cut the fingers. Off camera I milled up some white oak to 3 quarter inch thick pieces that were 3 and a half inches wide. I pre-cut 45 degree miters on my bottom corners and left 90 degrees for the top which will be a standard box joint. These pieces are cut longer than the dimensions shown because they have to account for the material thickness. Blade height is set to be just a hair higher than the thickness of the wood I'm using. A higher blade will cut a longer finger, and with box joints it's always best to have slightly longer fingers. It's easier to sand the proud fingers flush than to try and make shallow fingers look good. With our pre-cut bevel flush on the table saw surface and the board firmly against the indexing pin and jig itself, we are ready to cut. After our first finger is cut, simply move the board over onto the indexing pin. Repeat as necessary, taking care to ensure that the board stays parallel to our visual reference lines. The fingers on the corresponding side will be indexed off the piece we just cut. As long as the indexing pin is exactly one half inch from the blade, and the width of our stock is any multiple of one half inch, we will end up with a perfectly aligned box joint. After the initial cut, slide the stock firmly against the indexing pin and proceed with the rest of the cuts. These came out perfectly aligned and gap free. I then proceeded to the other side of the triangle. You may have noticed that I color code and numbered the sides. I do this to avoid mixing anything up and screwing up the orientation. The design of this jig does allow for the piece to be held with clamps rather than by hand, if that's something you'd prefer. I proceeded to cut the 90 degree box joints using a standard box joint jig. After a test fit, the pieces are glued together. The fingers that I cut slightly proud are then sanded flush. Now you can see how tightly these came out. I then cut a quarter inch deep, half inch wide rabbit on what will be the back of the flag case. I did this in three passes, raising the router bit a little bit each time. This rabbit will eventually accept the back panel. Next it was time to cut the front trim. I used eighth inch thick, one inch wide strips of white oak. 
The lower miters are cut to 22.5 degrees and the upper miters are cut at 45. Unfortunately, I neglected to get more footage of this part of the process. The trim strips were then glued to the flag case. After that, some finish sanding. And then I cut the glass. I finished the white oak with General Finishes Semi-Gloss Armor Seal. While the finish dried, I turned my attention to lining the back panel. The back panel itself is just a piece of quarter inch plywood made to fit the recess that we cut earlier. The glass was sealed in with a bead of clear silicone. The final step was attaching the back. Unfortunately, I do not have any folded flags on hand of this size available for pictures. Overall, I'm very happy with how the joinery came out.